We're not making up stuff on people. When you're a writer, how do you get your work out? I don't care what people think. I don't care what they say. They can say what they want to say about me. I don't care. I got the talent to write and I'm gonna keep on writing. We decided that we couldn't try this in the court of law. We're trying this in the court of public opinion. Just pay me what you owe me. We putting this out here so you guys can see. This has given us closure. I'm gonna put it to bed after this. I'm from the Bronx, New York. I was born and raised in the Bronx. I'm a 70s baby, so that ought to tell you how old I am. Uh, the Bronx was going through uh, hard times back in the 70s and 80s. There was a lot of abandoned buildings. There was a lot of poor people, uh, a lot of gangs and things like that. And so we had to use the Police Athletic League as an outlet and I went there and learned how to play uh, dancing, uh, learned some of my favorite hobbies, karate, and of course, writing and music. My name is William James. I'm from the best city in the world, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, from the, I was born on the west side, raised on the south side. Uh, I would tell y'all my age, but uh, <laughs> right. We'll let y'all guess that. Uh, but anyway, I was uh, raised in Parkway Gardens on uh, South Side of Chicago, which now they call the O Block. I had plans of being a writer when I was on the set in California, La Brea, California, after we met with Warner Brothers and we meaning my ex-husband, MC Shan. He was there working on his video that was directed by Julian Temple, who was Janet Jackson's uh, the producer of her music videos at the time. So I was on the set when Mindy Morin, the casting agent for Steve Martin came in and asked MC Shan to go to the set of LA Story to see if he would be interested in the part as the rapping waiter. So we got over there and Steve Martin's on this uh, golf court. And so I get on the golf court with Steve Martin and MC Shan. And after he determines that Shan can have the part, he then started to ask me what it was that I was interested in. And I told him, I don't want to act. He asked me if I wanted a part in the movie. I told him, no, I wasn't interested in acting. He said, well, what are you interested in? And I said, I want to write. He said, write what? I said, movies, films. He said, okay, I'll have my publicist send you a fully color-coded copy of my script. And we can take that script and allow you to use it to break down how a script is supposed to be written and use that as a template. I did that and he told me if I was ever interested, I could submit my copy of my script to his publicist. I was afraid. I said, no, I wrote it. I wrote the powers. I registered with the Writers Guild of East Coast. And I was like, he's more like a drama type, you know, uh, writer and actor. You notice he does like comedy and stuff like that. So I said, I got horror sci-fi. How am I send this to him? He's not interested in this. So I, I, I decided to just try to write and submit my stuff to other companies like the William Morris Agency and different people. And then, of course, uh, life pulled me away from writing for a while. And I got back into it when I was in the Army in 2007. My plans. First, my plans was to make some screenplays, uh, 
I've written two books, uh, 25 screenplays, was to try to step into the industry. But to be honest with you, Terry, I didn't know it was just hard to get into the industry. But that was my plan, was to uh, try to... Uh, I love to write. Uh, I was getting into it because I love to to make people laugh, uh, cry, you know, and and have fun just watching the movie, you know, like we used to do back in the old days, you remember? Yep, so that was my plan. So what inspired me to write was uh, I had no way to express myself. I had come from such hard times as a young kid. I needed a way to express all of the things that I seen and heard as a kid through trauma, happiness, love, um, everything that you could think of emotionally, I needed an outlet. And that's what inspired me to write. What inspired me to write my story about my book, Bad Apples Can Be Good Fruit, was the fact that I was a little nothing female who came from the ghetto that fell in love and got married to one of the hottest hip hop moguls and rappers in the 1980s, MC Shan. And for it was like a prince and the pauper story, you know, a pretty woman story, like they try to put it. And so I, I wanted to tell a lot of the gory details that happened to me as a child when I was on the streets of New York. And then at the same time, I wanted to also find a way to show a beautiful love story from a mixed uh, perspective. Someone who was sitting in a different place in life than I was that wanted me and wanted to have me. And so that book was inspired by that. A while ago, I, I want to say like maybe back in 2008 or nine, uh, that was one of the screenplays that I written about myself. Well, basically it was, it was more or less about myself and my wife. So when I, when I was writing it, it just came to me, you know? I mean, I just spoke the truth, you know? When you when you write about yourself, you try to speak the truth for the most part. And that's what inspired me to write that because at that time, me and my wife was going through some things, you know? Uh, and that's how I was feeling. So most writers, well, I ain't gonna say most writers, but I know me myself. Uh, when I write, it's, it's really all about a feeling when I'm emotional, you know. I mean, I, I guess it, it's how you feel at the time you're writing. At that time, I was kind of emotional, emotional, you know. So that's what inspired me to write. So I published my book by self-published with Infinity Publishing Company in 2007 when I was in the U.S. Army over in South Korea working as the NCYC of a Visual Information Support Center. And after I wrote this book in 07, I decided that after seeing so many of Tyler Perry's plays, they had videos circulating the base with Tyler Perry's movies, but they were really just theatrical plays. And I said, Wow, I heard that Tyler Perry in 2008 opened up a studio. I don't know if he opened it up in 07 or 08, but I know that he opened up a studio in Douglasville, Georgia. My sons were going to high school and junior high school in Douglasville, Georgia at the time. So uh, I had copyrighted the book. It was published. And then I decided to write Tyler Perry a letter telling him you know, I was in South Korea, I was in the U.S. Army, I was trying to get the book published in and adapted over into a movie, and um, it was already published at the time, excuse me, it was out uh, on sale for like Amazon and different places like that, and then 
his staff at the Perry studio, Tyler Perry studios in Douglasville was like, send us the book. So January 20th, 2008, I mailed the book to Douglasville. And when I would call month to month, you know, I would get these responses from the staff that would answer the phone saying he got that book on his desk. He got that book in his back pocket. He don't go nowhere without that book. He walks everywhere with that book. I would get this month to month, week after week while I was waiting. I was like, oh, okay. I was telling my family like, look, y'all, I- I'm telling you, I'm going to be the next filmmaker or writer adapted into a movie because he loves my book. I was excited. So then around September, I apologize. So it was around September. I called back in the beginning of September and I said, hey, you know, it's been a long time. You guys said he loved it and I haven't heard anything. Like, what is he going to do with it? And they were like, send us another copy. And I was like, another copy? Okay. They, I, they were like, you know, he won't let that one loose. So we would like a copy for ourselves. Somebody else wants to read it as well. So I, I'm thinking, you know, the production staff want an extra copy of the book. So I did, I went on my Amazon account that I still have today. And I sent it through Amazon to Tyler Perry Studios in Douglasville. And they sent me a shipping receipt, a received receipt to my email. And I still have that on my account to this day. Uh, It wasn't published, but it was definitely copyright. I had copyrights to it. Uh, And when, actually, I had a meeting with uh, a couple people about that script. And, uh, one meeting I had was with uh, Barbara Hunt that works, works for Open Works. And how I got a chance to meet Barbara Hunt was, I, I own a construction company and and the guy that works for me, actually, he, you know you know how people, when you're at work, when you're at work, people be talking to me, I know this person, I know that person, I know this person. I was like, yeah, right, you know, tell me. Tell me how you know her. And he, and he was like, well, that's my niece. I was like, really? And I was like, well, hook it up then. Hook it up. Normally, in my mind, I'm actually thinking he was lying. You know? So so he called me. Uh, you know, sometimes we work on Saturdays and sometimes we don't. But most of the time, Sundays we all, unless it's, we, we're trying to complete the job. So that's Sunday. He called me Sunday morning. He was like, look, get in your car. Come on over here. I got my niece here waiting on me. So I jumped in the car, rode on the west side, over there. And I, I, I decided to bring three screenplays, you know, to let them know I'm serious, you know, about what I do, you know. So I brought three screenplays with me. And me and her, we sat there and talked. Uh, she said she was going to have to read it first, you know. She was going to have to read it first. I said, cool, cool, cool. You can read it. And uh, she was going to get back with me. So a week passed. I called. She, she didn't call me. I called her. She said, yes, yes. Uh, they love it. So they was going to give me a call. Right? So I decided, you know, to uh, wait a little while longer, you know. And she still didn't call. Nobody called. So I called her again. <laughs> that was crazy at that time. Because, you know, I guess I was a little frantic as well, too. You know, because I was so I was so trying to get into that business. And it was like, she was like, well, don't call me no more. It ain't on me. I'm out of it. Uh, and I was like, how you, how you gonna tell me not to call you? And you have my work, right? You got my work. Well, they gonna call you. They gonna, uh, they gonna give you a call and email you. I said, okay. So after that, I couldn't even uh, contact her anymore. You know, she wouldn't answer the phone. She wouldn't do none of that. So at that point, I think I, I, I called her for the next three weeks, something like that, maybe a month, you know? And then it became the next year. But at first they was like, we love the work, right? That's- 
They, she said they love it. She kept, she kept telling me that they love it. Don't worry about it. They love it. They love it. They love it. They gonna call you. Tell you. I promise you. They gonna call you. And I said okay. I left it alone after that. I never received a phone call. So tell me, now you gave your work to Barbara Hunt, and. How did you get your work to her in the first place? Because she worked for Harpo Studios, right? Right, she worked for Harpo Studios. She was an accountant for Harpo Studio. I found out later that she was the accountant for Harpo. And, uh, but the funny part about all this is, after a while passed, after I gave him my work, the, the guy who uh, worked for me had quit maybe a few months prior, you know. And uh, so one day, uh, I, was, I was on my on my motorcycle and I was I was went up to the gas station to get some gas. So but you know on my helmet my helmet has like a uh, like a shade, you know from the sun and stuff like that. So but when I took my helmet off I looked to my left I see this guy pumping some gas and I recognized him. So I walked, I walked over to the pump. I said, I said, what's happening, man? How you doing? You know, he was like, oh, I'm good, I'm good. And this, I remind you, this man was driving a new car. He was, uh, had jewelry on. And when I hired him, basically, this man was homeless, basically. He was, he didn't have no money, but it appears at that moment he had some. So I asked him, you know, I said, uh, where's your niece? You know, uh, I need to speak with her. And he was like, I haven't seen her in a while. So I said, well, when you when you uh, see her, please tell her I'm looking for her. I need for her to call me. Because by that time, she had changed her number. And that niece was who? Barbara Hunt. Oh. Barbara Hunt. And where did Barbara Hunt work? She worked as the accountant for Harpo. Yeah, for Harpo City. Yeah. So that's how that went. So when did you discover and when what you perceived to be your work? When did I discover it? Yeah. The Tyler Perry had... Uh, took a uh, part of your screenplay or your book that you've written. Oh, wow. So now we talking, it was years later. I got out the army in 08, in October. Went back to Illinois where I had my house with my husband, whom I had a divorce and, and inherited the house. And I'm staying there and I got two different job offers, one to Wisconsin and La Crosse, and one back to South Korea as the chief of the Visual Information Support Center, the same job I had just come out of as the NCYC in Camp Humphrey. So I was like, all of the information that I had been receiving from them at the studios were, uh, you know, that it was all good, it was a go, but I got wrapped up in my life. I got tired of calling and getting, he's in a meeting, he's in a meeting. You know, the typical, when you call an executive, he's always in the meeting, right? So then I'm sitting in bed in 2012 and there's a commercial that comes on AFN, that's Armed Forces Network. And I'm laid up there and I'm like, looking, I'm like, you know, I love when I get to see commercials for new movies because the Post Theater has all these cool movies that come out almost like first before everyone else gets them. So th it was Tyler Perry's new Good Deeds and I was like, oh, he was busy making movies. And then the commercial played or, or the trailer played for Good Deeds. And I was like, okay, okay. Did you attempt, did you attempt to contact Tyler Perry? Heck yeah, I was like, that's mine. I was like, maybe it's because I changed my phone number. Maybe it's because I changed, you know, my PO box from the military side to the, to the, to the, uh, GS side of the government. I was like, he's looking for me. I said, okay. So you know what I did? 
I went on Twitter because I couldn't, I called the studios and I heard that there was a fire. It was 2012 now. This is February 2012 when the movie was supposed to be released. And it was, you know, the AFN trailer had come on. And so I'm in, I'm in Korea. So I don't know what it said for the U.S. side. Maybe it was like an early release, but it was the beginning of February. And so I couldn't get him, like, you know, the company, the, the, the actual staff, they weren't answering the phones. I didn't know what happened. I heard there was a fire at the studios. And so then I contacted him on Twitter. I got on Twitter. I was like, hey, Tyler, you're looking for me right? I know you're looking for me. Hey, get in contact with me. Here's my email address. No response. I was like, okay. I don't, I don't, I don't no, I was like, okay. I don't think he's, I, I think maybe he's busy. I don't think he realizes who I am. Maybe he don't know it's me. You know? That's a possibility because they act like he knew it was you. They just act like they don't. <laughs> Did you attempt to contact Tyler Perry after you made your discovery? And was there a response? Yeah, 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 yeah. Look, look, this this is funny. Check this out. This is real funny. And so what I did was I, I sent uh, Tyler Perry email. First I sent Oprah email, right? And then they, when Oprah responded, she responded, um, like, well, whatever y'all send us is mad. I said, huh? So basically, I have to get some clarity here, okay? What year did you give your stuff to Barbara Hunt, your book, or, or your your Lover's Kill script? What, what year was that? In 2011. I gave my script to Barbara Hunt in 2011. And then what year did you contact Tyler Perry and realize that your work was being used by Tyler Perry? I contacted Tyler Perry when I realized my work was being used in 2013. Actually, actually it was it, it was before 2013. It was 2000, yeah, 2013. Because I, I, I received an email, uh, a, a pilot, a pilot uh, trailer in an email. And uh, a pilot of what? Love of uh, uh, temptation, confession of a marriage counselor. And so you believe that that was your lover's kill manuscript? I believe that was my lover's kill because in my script, uh, all the parts he showed in the trailer was in my screenplay. Every part that he showed in that trail was in my screen. And when I when I looked at that, it's either I think I felt I felt heartbroken, but I felt good all at the same time. And what do you mean by that? Well, it was nice to see that somebody was interested in my work because you know when you uh, when you when you're a writer and. And you really don't have anything out. Uh, it's like people judge, you know, judge your writing, your writing skill. You know, people judge your ideas and all that. And I didn't want to be let down, you know. So I was glad actually that he liked it, you know, and that they liked it. I was glad because it's, it's kind of hard to. Uh, let somebody read your work and then you be judged, you know. Like, that's why you see a lot of uh, movies out there that's not so good, you know. So I was glad to see that they liked it. So, but then again, I was kind of angry at the same time because I knew at that point that I had been had, you know, that they, some, some had happened, you know, that because I was looking for, I was still looking for an email. I was still looking for a phone call at that point. I just knew they was gonna call me. I'm like, yeah, they about to call me now. So a few months passed, I was like, nah, they ain't about to call me. But I found out way before the movie uh, hit the big screen. Then uh, when I called, they postponed it. 
They postponed what? They postponed the movie. What? They changed the name. What did they change it from? So the trailer had one name and what they really released was a different name. Right. Well, it was the same name, but they added to the name. See, at first it was just Temptation. And then they they uh, had a confession of a marriage counselor. Oh. You know, so it looked like somebody was telling the story. You know, like that. So they changed it up because when I called, it, it didn't come out to the next year. You know? Oh, so it seemed like it delayed based on the fact that yes. you called them and was trying to get through about your right, my script. your script. And, and they, they delayed it. So I guess they had to do a little bit more changing, just changing it up, I guess. I don't know. Uh, when did they release the movie? They released it in, uh, I believe it was March of uh, 2013. So that's two years after they had your script. Two years and some months, actually. Yeah. So when you attempted to contact Tyler Perry, what did you, how, which mode did you use? Phone, email, what did you use to get? I emailed him. I emailed him, that's what I did. And I emailed Oprah too. Cause you know, you never had a direct phone number. So I emailed him. And when I emailed him, I didn't even realize until recently that he sent me an email back. <laughs> oh, <Lord. laughs> when did you realize he sent you an email back? When, uh, when me and Terry started uh, going over uh, uh, information that we had on him, you know. And so, when me and you started going over the information, I, uh, I read it. I, I said, I didn't get this back then. Oh, so you happened to see it in your inbox while you was looking for stuff and you was going through your emails, you found it. I found it. Yeah, I found it. And I was like, let me read this. And when I read it, he was talking about how how a car got into an accident. Because at that time, first let me tell you, at that time, I was rehabbing houses and selling cars. That's my thing. I've been doing that for years. I rehab houses and I sell cars. So uh so when that happened, uh, when so when I when I uh, I read the email and it said it said you know how you buy a car and you get into an accident and you tear up the car then you take it to the shop and you can never get after they 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 do the body work on the car right when they do the body work on the car the body work be perfect but they can never get the paint just quite right. It kind of dawned on me when he said that. It's like, I took it, this is how I took it. You know when you write a screenplay and you give it to somebody and they and they copy your screenplay and you, and you try, to, try to sue, you can never get it quite right. You can never actually prove that they infringe on your copyright. Because I guess they changed it so much and it made, made it there, you know, it made it there. That's what they did. So tell us what issues arose between the time you attempted to contact Tyler and you to take action. Oh. So the issues that came up when I tried to contact him and how I decided to take action was his failed responses. So my heart like kind of dropped into my stomach. Cause I was like, wait a minute, they released the movie. It's doing good in the box office, but he won't call me back. Like maybe I need, I know how this works in the entertainment industry. Sometimes they don't want to communicate with you directly cause they don't want to say nothing that they're going to be liable for. And since this is a case of maybe he couldn't find me after a few years and lost contact with me and I stopped calling that he released the movie, but he had a check waiting for me. Or, you know, he needed me to have my legal counsel communicate with him directly. So I got an attorney from Pennsylvania. His name was Simon Rosen. He was at the time working on something on my music side of the house because I have music royalties for stuff that I wrote back in the days. 
uh, Informer uh, with Snow, the artist Darren O'Brien. And uh, I was trying to get some clarity from Universal at the time. And so he was working on that project. And I said, hey, can you look into communicating with Tyler Perry for me? Because he made my movie from my book. And uh, I really think he's trying to find me. <laughs> wow. <sighs> uh, you really think that he was doing I really believe it. It was like, you know, everything that my book was about was in his trailer. And it was the same. And I knew he had my book for at least four years. So I'm like, yeah, <laughs> this man is looking for me. And so my attorney, you know, he was like, I'll reach out to him. Give me your book. And um, what are you looking for? Because, you know, there was no negotiated contract. And we don't know how much he's planning on paying you. So let's just go ahead and communicate with his attorneys and find out so we can do this amicably and quickly. We thought it was going to be quick. No lawsuit needed, you know? So did your attorney access your work and watch the movie prior to accepting the case stating uh, that if she believed a bit with your work? Oh, boy. Did he? Okay. So after uh, my attorney read my book and he asked for... Um, the name of the movie and he watched the movie. He went to the movies and watched the movie. He came back with a whole bunch of similarities. He could see that the eclectic jewelry that was worn by the girlfriend at the beginning of the movie and Good Deeds where Thandie Newton, uh, the character would have been Cheryl from my book, had a piece of uh, jewelry in her ear that signified Africa. And that signif that's significant to me saying that the woman in the beginning of my book wore African-American eclectic jewelry to identify as her African heritage. And then there was a misunderstanding in the beginning of my book under Bad Apples Can Be Good Fruit where Cheryl, she was a hothead. She was always jumping to conclusions. And, you know, she, she, you know, she misunderstood that there was a taxi cab issue that it wasn't hers. This guy had called this taxi and she was fighting with him over this taxi cab and she was real crass and rude and nasty I realized she made the mistake and that she was being disrespectful same thing happened in good deeds but it was over a parking spot instead of a taxi cab but it was both dealing with vehicles you know she got out the car and she was being nasty or whatever in Tyler Perry's uh good deeds she, Danny Newton was like, this is my parking spot and I'll park here if I want to. He was like, no, this is a co-owned parking spot, you know, and the brother was being rude and nasty and crass or whatever and arguing with her back and forth and she still took her way. And then there was a part where the mother, uh, what, okay, so what he did was different with mine. What he did was he took and he separated the child and the mother to give the little girl's experience at the time that the, everything was happening in real time. But in my book, Cheryl's childhood had the same issues and circumstances as the little girl in his movie, such as being disrespected by an older man and him, you know, talking down to her and cussing her out and talking about her mother. Uh, the same thing happened when the child was taken into foster care. Uh, the same thing happened with the child lived in a car with her mother and bathed in a gas station. Uh, bathroom but in my book the child slept on a train car and would bathe in the train station bathroom uh, to get ready for her day uh, the boyfriend inherited his talents and his you know everything from his father and his father's father that's the same the daughter was taken um, like I said into foster care the same way except for this was Sandy Newton's daughter and instead this was Cheryl's childhood and so he for the sake of taking and adapting a movie from a book you have to lose certain elements because it takes too much time to go back into her past to argue the situation or to show the situation so it's better to show it in real time and compress or separate the characters and then uh, you know uh, he was saying like how uh, they ended up 
being in a relationship by mistake and all those different things. I mean, there's just so many. I'm not going to go into all of them. I have page after page. My attorney was like, this is an open and shut case. He was like, they just going to give you your money. But he decided to take action because he couldn't get through to their attorneys. And it didn't seem that they were trying to pay me for anything. Okay, so now tell us what issues arose between the time you attempted to contact Tyler Perry and the decision to take action. Well, when they would never answer me. When they would never answer me, and then they kept getting closer and closer to the due date of the movie. So, uh, a week before uh, the movie was coming out, I would have got an attorney. But I figured they weren't going to call me by then anyway. The movie was just going to come on out. So, when I went to get the attorney, the attorney went over my screenplay, uh, and he was like, uh, well, we got to wait till the movie come out on Friday. We're going to go see it and see what happened. So Friday came and we went to the movie, you know, and we sat there and watched the whole movie. When we came out of there, he turned around and looked at me after the movie was over. And we walked out. He turned around and looked at me and said, congratulations, you have kids. Hey, can you tell me Brief description of Love is Kill. Well, Love is Kill is about uh, it's about a husband and wife uh, going through some things and uh, infidelity takes place. I know, I know that's that's a cliche movie. You know, it's all cliche when it comes to a husband cheating on a wife or a wife cheating on a husband. You know, it's a cliche movie. And so, but in this instance, this movie wasn't a cliche movie because it was about my life, you know. And can you give me some, can you give me some examples of why you think a cliche movie like Temptations, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor would have compartments and elements of Love is Killed that were changed, but the same as what you wrote. Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, you know how how it's, it's not how you view the movie, but it's, it's how you write the movie. You know, two people can't have the same idea. You can have the same idea, but when you express your idea and I express my idea, it's going to be completely different. You know, we, I don't care how many writers you put in one room. If everybody writing about the same thing, it's going to be, if 10 writers in, in a room writing about the same idea, all 10 stories are going to be different. Can't two people, don't know two people think the same. So what are some examples uh, from Lover's Kill that identify with Temptations, Confessions of a Marriage Counselor that give you an inclination that was um, a sort of recap of what you did in your 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 script. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give you three of them. Because okay. I, can go, I can go on and on. Okay, the, the first part was when, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to dip. Well, no, I ain't going to dip. I'm going to start at the beginning. Uh, when he get off of work, she come home, they both sitting at the dinner table having, having a discussion, you know. Uh, and at this point, as she flops, come in the house and flops down on the couch, kick her shoes off, you know, he did the same thing. Uh, and and have dinner, did the same thing. Uh, the, the second thing is when uh, a special time come along, uh, they start singing. You know, sing, he, well, he starts singing to each other. Uh, well, not each other, but he starts singing to her. Actually, the boyfriend was singing to her because he knew he was about to, you know, get ready to have sex with her. And uh, he put in this movie uh, that the husband grabbed the guitar and started singing to her. You know, then when she went in uh, after 
she went in the bathroom and started singing. I mean, not singing, but when she went in the bathroom, he uh, she started thinking, you know, in her mind how sex was after she just left him. You know, then uh, he did the same thing in his movie. Then uh, they had hot tub dinner, flowers everywhere, steam, and he did the same thing. Uh, in his movie, uh, they when the boy, two boyfriend, the boyfriend and the husband had a fight, you know, he did the same thing, you know. Uh, but instead of him falling through a glass table, he fell, he fell through a window. Uh, I can, I can keep going on and on about that. I mean, I mean, really, I can keep going, you know. So, prior to filing your case. Is your attorney contact Tyler Perry? Is it legal to? He finally got in touch with them and they just basically uh, signed a uh, summons and waiver saying that they would appear in court and he filed there in the district court of Pennsylvania. And so, you know. What was the outcome? The outcome of that, well, it was transferred. They transferred my case to the Southern District of New York from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. There wasn't even a motion on the record. There was nothing to explain how it transferred, why it transferred, under what regulation or statute it was transferred. It was just transferred from Pennsylvania over into New York. My attorney said it was because I had no contacts in Pennsylvania other than him. I don't know what that exactly means. I guess they're saying because I never lived there or was not a resident of Pennsylvania. And since he used my address since I was overseas, that wasn't good enough for them because I didn't have a stateside address. So did your attorney meet face-to-face -face with Tom Ferber? He met face-to-face -face with Tom Ferber uh, and he went to the record and told the courts that he begs their indulgence, the judge's indulgence, because... He stated that he was hospitalized. He didn't go into how or what. And then on emails, when he was supposed to file an appeal, he was like, I told you from the beginning I was being threatened. So I don't know what all that means. And I don't know how that translates, but he did beg the court's indulgence. Right. So did they, did they offer you anything not to file an appeal? No, they didn't offer me anything. Uh, they were my 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 attorney was like, I can get you a book deal and a movie deal if you would just let this go. And I'm like, how? You know, what, what's this about? No, no. You think, you think your attorney had had a conversation with him about that? I think it's a possibility. Um, it was just strange how he changed his demeanor. It was like one minute he was gung ho, this was it. And then the next minute he was scared and he was like, in all the years that I practiced, the 30 years that I practiced, I never been uh, blindsided by the things that's happened to me in this case. And uh, I could lose everything with this case. And I'm saying to myself, how do you lose everything with a case? That ain't got nothing to do with you. I would lose everything, but how do you lose everything? So I didn't understand how that translated into my case, but he was so all for it. And then he claimed that you know, the day that he was supposed to appear in court and get his Pro Hoc Vici accepted or denied, the judge accepted it and then forced him to argue the case on the spot. Now, according to the record, they was already in default because when that case transferred from the Eastern District of Pennsylvania over to the Southern District of New York, when you look at the record, he signed, they both signed, uh, Tyler Perry's uh, attorney agreed and signed to what is called a uh, a waiver of summons and service. And he said that in the stipulation that the judge has signed, he said, in this stipulation, you will answer the, the lawsuit within 60 days or default the whole case. And in 60 days, they had not answered. Matter of fact, it was eight months before they answered the record. And when they did, they did it in a letter, not in a motion, under a 12C, under a letter 12C. And according to the Southern District uh, of New York, 56 and uh, 12, 
and motion practice for their local rules. It says you may not do motion practice to dispose the case under a letter. It must be in the form of a motion. Okay. Uh, so, so did anything ever happen to your attorney? My attorney kept saying that it was deep, deep, dark, dark. He kept saying that, you know, it's winding and it's turning and there's twists and this is a deep, deep, dark situation. And, you know, he, he doesn't want anything to happen to his career. And he kept saying stuff like, I'll kick in the money to pay for the legal fees if you just let it go. And I'm like, no. <laughs> Did he ever get hospitalized? He said, he said he was hospitalized on the record. He told the judge, he said, look, I beg your indulgence. I was hospitalized and I'm asking you to help me after meeting with Tom Ferber and uh, his attorney. Wow. So how did that make you feel after that happened? Did you get scared? I wasn't afraid at all because I'm like, how could they start bullying us? Or how can I be afraid to go after what I believe is rightfully mine? Like, you can't even give me like a small amount of money to pay me for the work. I mean, my book was good enough for you to turn it into a movie. And now I'm supposed to just walk away empty handed. I didn't think that was fair. I didn't, I wasn't willing to give in. And then they, they kept doing wrong stuff on the record. And so I just got rid of my attorney. I, I asked him to withdraw and we had a a um, teleconference with the judge, with Tyler Perry's attorney and my attorney. And he, you know, because I have filed a motion under Rule 60 because he failed to file the motions. He failed to file the motion to, um, what do they call that when you, um uh, for a reconsideration? Because there was no discovery, like he said in the, in the, uh, there was a transcript to the argument that I just got admitted into the uh, into the courthouse this morning. You just approved it. Now you want me to fight the whole case in one day, the same day? He was like, there's not been no discovery. There's not been nothing. He was like, no, I don't agree to go forward with this. And the judge was kind of like trying to bully him and force him to speak about the case and argue the merits of the case on the spot. Wow. And he was like, Your Honor. He was and and really with a 12C, when you present information outside of the case, like, you know, we didn't get a chance to put the whole book on the record. They took the snippets. You know, when you adapt the book into a movie, you leave some parts out because it's too much to put in, right? They right. took all of the snippets they could find that wasn't the same as the movie. And said, see, it's not the same. Well, why didn't you submit the whole book? Why are you just going to take little pieces out of it? Especially the pieces that don't even match up to the scenes that were in my book and the movie. Right. So we had not had a chance to put Discovery on the record. The Our book, the whole book was not allowed to be put on the record yet. Uh, the evidence that shows that he had direct access. But then Tom Ferber did say in his letter motion which he was not allowed to do he said yeah Tyler Perry did have the book and so what if he did and so what if he read the book there's no substantial similarity according to you since we ain't do discovery and we didn't get a chance to put it on a record so you know I Well, yeah, I, I, I hired the first attorney when uh, when I discovered that we came when we came out of the theater, and he said I had a pretty good case, you know. And uh, when he said that, I mean, I, I immediately got happy, you know. And he was like, "Well, maybe we can get you a, a three movie deal." I was like, "Cool." I said, "Whatever you can do, let's do it." So. He filed a complaint 
against them. And when he filed a complaint, uh, he he, he kind of like waited, you know, uh, for a while. I guess it, before they answered, it had to be like maybe about, I want to say uh, a little over a month, I guess. And I guess at that point, they had defaulted at that time, you know? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking to myself, uh, man, they defaulted today. So I guess they just going to pay. And all of a sudden, he gives me a call, you know, and he was like, uh, I can't do this case anymore. I'm like, what? I said, we just discussed last week that, uh, that I had a real good case. He was like, uh... Well, I'm gonna give you enough time to find you an attorney uh, before I uh, excuse myself from the case. So I said, okay, uh, well, let me find me an attorney. So when I did find the attorney, uh, another attorney, he appeared in court for me. Cause it was, you know, they only, they only gave me 30 days. So I asked, I found an attorney. So we appeared in court. Then when we appeared in court, he was like, uh, the judge was like, uh, he asked him, can he have time to uh, amend the complaint? And the judge gave him time to amend the complaint. So after that, so I'm waiting uh, to really talk to him, to contact him. So we spoke uh, about the first week. And when, he, when we spoke, the man said, we met at the library. He went through the case. He went through everything, just like the first attorney did. He went through everything. And so when we went through everything, uh, he was like, you got, a, you got a real good case. So I said, okay, uh, you gonna amend the complaint? He said, he was gonna amend the complaint. So after that, I really didn't even hear from the man no more. It was all over with. I guess he must've gave him a call. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't dismiss himself from the case. He didn't do none of that. So, and I'm wondering, I'm like, 30 days had passed. So I'm trying to call him, he didn't answer the phone. I'm trying to call him, no answer, no answer, no answer. So maybe, I want to say a month and a half passed, I said, I decided to go to his office. When I got to the mayor's office, believe this or not, his entire office was moved. You mean nothing was there, it was empty? Not a table, a chair, or anything. And I'm like, wow, what happened? I'm saying to myself, I can't imagine that. You were devastated, right? I was devastated. Like, you walk into your, and he's still your attorney, right? Right. And I'm steady calling him. I'm steady calling him. I'm calling him. I'm calling him. I'm calling him. He still never answered the phone. So I said, let me, uh, let me go to the courthouse and find out what's going on at the courthouse, see if he filed all his paperwork. Do you know when I got to the courthouse, they had dismissed my case? The whole case? The entire case. They had dismissed it. And so I asked them for the paperwork. They wouldn't give me no paperwork on the case. And I said, why I can't get the paperwork? Why I can't get the dismissal? He said, because you have an attorney. I said, I haven't talked to this attorney since he started this. I don't even know where this man is. He don't even have an office anymore. I don't know where he is. And she was like, well, ain't nothing we can do. We can't give you no information on the case. None. So I said, okay. So I said, I can't write a motion. I can't do anything like that. It was like, I can't get a reconsideration or nothing like that. She was like, no, not until he dismissed himself from the case. So when he, the man, when he started up. Uh, so I have a question. Between the first attorney and the second attorney, when the first attorney decided he didn't want to be on your case anymore. Was there anything that you could think of that made you feel like, was there something on the record? Was it something that he received? Did he meet with them? Did, did something happen between Tyler Perry company employee and your attorney, your first attorney? Well, I can't say what happened in the beginning when he talked to them or whatever what happened. I can't even tell you that because I wasn't there. But what I what I think what happened, I think he may have gotten threatened or something, or uh, he 
what he told me was uh, that he talked to them and they 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 gave him a, a screenplay and the screenplay was totally different. And I told him, I said, well, let me see the screen. You know, like that. And he never did give me the screenplay. So, uh, and then he he uh, gave me the paperwork saying that, that he's off the case. And for me, he, they gave me 30 days to find an attorney. You know? So now when your second attorney came on, did he know what happened with your first attorney? Yeah, he did because I explained it to him. And so he was still comfortable taking the case? He was still comfortable taking the case. He was still comfortable taking the case. And when he uh, took the case, actually he showed up in court for me. Oh. Because my 30 days was actually up when I found him. So I asked him to show up for court for me. And he, he came, he showed up for court for me. And he had to do a, a, a pro hoc vici because he wasn't, he wasn't from Indiana, he was from Chicago. So he, he had to get, you know, do, do the whole paperwork thing to get signed over in Indiana so he could be my attorney. So, so then after that happened, after that happened, uh, we went to the library, you know, we went to the library and we, we did the case. We went over my cousin's house after the library. We did the case, we did all the similarities, we did everything, you know. And then uh, after that, I never heard from the man ever again. Not even to this day. I haven't heard from him, I heard from him one time since then. Since then. So did anything happen between that attorney and the court system, your second attorney, what was his name? Theodore, Roosevelt Theodore Jameson. And what happened to Theodore Roosevelt Jameson? He, uh, well, since I, since I didn't hear from him, I filed a grievance against him with the bar. Since I didn't hear from him. And they sent me a letter back saying that uh, they knew who I was talking about and uh, they questioned him and uh, and called him in a lot of lies, uh, saying he said he wasn't my attorney, but they said he was automatically his attorney once you appeared in court for him. And, and what happened to you? He said he never heard from you again. He said, well, because he figured that he wasn't my attorney. You know? So he didn't have to show up to court or nothing like that. But he didn't have to write no, uh, no amended complaint as he told the judge that he would, you know, and and uh, and actually they suspended him indefinitely until he answered my charges. Is he still suspended to this day? In two thousand, what year was that that he was suspended? I believe that bar? I believe that was in I want to say uh, twenty fourteen. And this is twenty twenty three. He's still suspended to this day because he hasn't answered your case. Right, well, they haven't contacted me. They said, once he answered the charges, they'll contact me. And he hasn't contacted me yet. They, they, well, the bar hasn't contacted me yet. And I guess uh, he's still, well, to my knowledge, he's still suspended to this day. You know, if you look him up on the computer, I, I believe he's still suspended. Because you and I looked him up and he was still suspended. Yes, we did see that. That was in 2017 when we looked it up, I think, last. Right. Right, and he got suspended in 2015. So that was already two years. 